Welcome. Welcome to London Business School. Uh, I know there's a mixture of London Business School student alumni and external guests. And this is the SAMI Offer Centre, which is one of our major buildings on campus. And I believe that there's about a thousand people have signed up, registered for tonight's event. Uh, so many of them, of course, are, are online, watching live on Zoom. So welcome to you. And we've got a good audience in the room. Uh, the host tonight is the Wheeler Institute. Uh, many of you will know what the Wheeler Institute is. It was thanks to a gift from Tony and Maureen Wheeler, who are LBS alumni, and also they founded the Lonely Planet Guides. Many of you will have used their Lonely Planet Guides at some point. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Christos Stylianides. I'm not going to do a full introduction. I think that's going to come in a couple of minutes. Uh, he's got a wonderful title, Minister for Climate Crisis and Civil Protection. I believe that is a world first. And I think a lot of this evening is about actually exploring what that means, not just for Greece, obviously, but for Europe and the world. Before we get going, just a quick acknowledgement of some of the things that London Business is, School is doing in this area. Uh, I've been the vice dean at London Business School just for a year or so, uh, but I've always had a passion for doing new things, things that matter to the world. And I don't think I need to persuade this group of people that sustainability uh, and responding to climate change and to some degree arresting climate change and everything that goes with that is, you know, the biggest endeavor challenge of our lifetimes. And London Business School is working very hard to, to support the, the, the world's uh, work in this area. Three areas which London Business School is working on. First of all, uh, a lot of research happening, some through the Wheeler Institute, some through our faculty. You're going to meet at least one of them this evening. Uh, secondly, through our teaching and our learning activities, our courses. Uh, so I oversee all of our degree programs, and we're working very hard to ensure that our students have a nice lineup of courses throughout their two years here uh, to ensure that they've got all the tools they need to become experts in sustainability and related areas. And then thirdly, of course, our campus itself has to become sustainable. And we're working very actively right now on that. We're about to appoint, actually, a director for sustainability for the school. And that will happen in the next two or three months or so. So it's a hugely important imperative for us collectively. And there's a group of us here. I see many of the front row tonight are my colleagues at the school who are working alongside me to try to make this a reality. So very important, very, very delighted to be here. And I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Yanis, yes, Yanis Ioannou, who is, a, like me, a professor in the strategy department at the London Business School. And he is our host for this evening. So welcome, Yanis. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Uh, ladies and I usually don't go behind podiums because they pose a height issue, but today, tonight I will. So um, thank you so much for joining us in person and, uh, and, and of course, online. Uh, it's really a privilege uh, to be here, and uh, I would like to say some words about why we're here today and what this event is all about. So this week, as uh, many of you, you might know, on Saturday the 22nd, we're celebrating Earth Day 2023, and Earth Day is a global movement that is dedicated to raising awareness and inspiring action to confront our planet's environmental challenges. The theme of this year's Earth Day is Invest in Our Planet, which calls on governments, businesses, and citizens to work together to create a green, prosperous, and equitable future for, human, uh, for humanity and nature. Now, to mark this occasion, we set up this event that uh, is very generously hosted by the, the Wheeler Institute. Um, and we have invited a distinguished guest who has dedicated his life and his career to date um, to investing, precisely as the theme says, um, in climate and in address addressing crisis more broadly. Um, he is Mr. Christos Tilianidis, who is the Minister of Climate Crisis and Civil Protection of Greece. Now, I quite literally spent the last three days finding all the, all the things that Christus has achieved in his many years of service, and it took me quite a lot of time to do this editing that I'm going to share with you today. So this is the brief version of what he has been able to, to achieve. So um, allow me, because I know Christus for about 25 years now, to say that uh, he's a man of many talents and achievements. He's a dental surgeon by training a politician by passion, and a humanitarian by conviction. Uh, he has served Cyprus, Greece, and the European Union in various capacities, and uh, in, in my humble opinion, always with dedication, 
integrity, a rare commodity in politics these days, professionalism, and a profound vision. So a little bit about his background. He was elected as member of the Cyprus House of Representatives in 2006, and he served until 2013. He is what I would call a hardcore European, um, and he was a leading figure in supporting Cyprus accession to the European Union, political reform, and of course, a solution to the Cyprus problem. In 2014, he was elected member of the European Parliament. Um, then he was uh, appointed as the European Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management, and a role, that's a role that he held until 2019. In that capacity, he oversaw EU's humanitarian assistance and disaster response efforts around the world, managing a budget of over 2 billion euros per year. He also served as the EU's Ebola coordinator in 2014, leading the bloc's response to the Ebola virus epidemic in West Africa. As European Commissioner, among several other achievements, and I said I, I have really cut this down, um, he prioritized and systematically worked to promote what he called education in emergencies, increasing the budget for the humanitarian and portfolio, uh, a, sorry, a humanitarian aid portfolio in emergency education tenfold, from 1% in 2015 to 10% today. Christos is also the architect of RescueU, an initiative that significantly upgraded the European civil protection system and was included among the 20 most significant achievements of the Juncker Commission. The aim of Rescue is to develop all infrastructure so that the EU, very relevant to our topic tonight, is in a position to respond more promptly and effectively to the consequences of climate change, the dramatic increase in natural disasters, both within and outside Europe, epidemic management and the provision of immediate assistance in case of a nuclear or chemical um, accident. Finally, uh, in September 2021, Christos was appointed by Prime Minister Mitsotakis as Greece's first minister for the climate crisis and civil protection after Greece uh, faced several devastating wildfires that destroyed millions of hectares of woodland. He is responsible for improving the country's preparedness and response to natural disasters, as well as addressing the impacts of climate change. Within the first year of his ministerial term, Christos promoted the development of a national strategy for climate change and, change and civil protection with a specific action plan based on three very important dimensions, prevention, preparedness, and resilience. Uh, in this direction, a national dialogue on the climate crisis and its challenges was inaugurated at the end of 2021 with active participation for parliamentary parties, the scientific community, and civil society. Uh, at the same time, Christos systematically worked to upgrade Greece's role and, uh, and further promoting cooperation in the field of civil protection at European, regional, and bilateral levels. So, I'll conclude by saying, um, uh, Mr. Stylianidis, Minister Stylianidis, is a man of action, compassion, and integrity. And I hope you have seen through this excerpt of his achievement, his commitment to integrity, but importantly, human dignity, solidarity, and diversity, both in his humanitarian as well as his climate work to date. So what will happen today is that we'll first have the chance to hear some opening remarks from Minister Stylianidis, followed by a Q&A uh, with, with myself. Uh, for all of those of you that are in the room or uh, especially at home, um, please do send us your questions. I would be monitoring them on a rolling basis. So if they are relevant to the discussion we're having, I'm going to ask them as we go along. Otherwise, we'll also allow uh, time at the end for additional um, Q&A. So without any further ado, Mr. Stylianidis, an honor and a privilege, and uh, please join, uh, join us at the, at the podium. Thank you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Yanis, for your kind words. As always, these kind words, it's part of the game <laughs> to introduce someone. And thanks again. But as you know, there is a, a sort of Greek word, hyperbole. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Let me first uh, say. Once again, a big thank you to professors Elias Papayuanu, Yanis Ioannou, and Tiago Ivo Martino. Thank you. You know that I'm a good in Portuguese. 
and of course the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development for inviting me to speak here at this, you know better than me, really very prestigious institution, London Business School. In particular, on a really special occasion to celebrate Earth Day 2023. It is a privilege and it is an opportunity to reflect on challenges our plan faces today to build a sustainable environment. Also, an opportunity to reiterate our commitments, but also an opportunity for a pragmatic look into how we deal with the hard reality. I'm really very grateful for this opportunity because it was something we had discussed with Yanis before for many years. So I'm very pleased to join you today in my capacity as Minister for Climate Crisis and Civil Protection, but also as a former European Commissioner for Crisis Management and Humanitarian Aid. Dear friends, I know that uh, the work that the Wheeler Institute is doing to promote sustainable and inclusive development is no doubt first class. So <laughs> you will be very proud of this, my dear friend. And uh, I really approach this event as a brainstorming among knowledgeable and concerned people, individuals, a distinguished group of students, academics, professionals, experts, journalists, and I have to say that the vast majority of you being more knowledgeable than me, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so I'm not here to lecture you or give you all the answers. I'm here to put on the table the hard questions and dilemmas and share some of my thoughts about the best ways to address them, to address these really very crucial challenges in a realistic framework. So I look forward to a constructive conversation. Allow me first to start with the big picture to lay out the political aspects which underline the strategy towards a greener and more sustainable future. The hard reality is that climate change, maybe it's better terminology, climate crisis is one of the most pressing challenges for our planet. Maybe the most pressing. As we all know, Climate change is causing more frequent and severe natural disasters. Wildfires, severe floods, droughts, etc., etc. Extreme weather phenomena are the new normal all across the globe. I strongly believe that the facts speak for themselves. So the challenge is really huge. The dilemmas are hard in politics, in my very demanding field, we have to make really difficult choices based on our principles, but also grounded on realms and rationalism. There is no question that our strategic goal is to fully implement our commitments identified in the European Green Deal, but also our global commitments, commitments under the Paris Agreement. I was in the very small negotiated team in Paris at that time when we negotiated Paris Agreement, and uh, I was really very optimistic at that time. But the next COPs, I can say, they didn't go in the same dimension and with the same speed in order to, to, to reach our common goal. But 
to achieve our common strategic goal, we need flexibility. We need readiness to adjust our interconnected and sometimes, or many times, controversial policies. This is dictated by geopolitical and socioeconomic developments. And, of course, by real life, by the everyday life of the ordinary people. Let me explain. The war in Ukraine has destabilized the geopolitical system. This is a war within Europe. Our generation, here is my good friend, Nobelist Sarides, and other compatriots, professors, Mr. Kurta Markidis, Mr. Yakovidis. In our generation, we never believe that we will experience a kind of war within Europe, especially after the collapse of the communist regime. But the history always is really surprising us. So the new geopolitical environment creates really unprecedented uncertainty. Inflation, fluctuating energy prices, higher, higher interest rates, all this create a volatile environment, completely volatile. An environment which puts pressure both on governments, but also on the society. So we recognize that governments and societies find it very difficult to implement commitments. We are at a critical juncture. That's why Prime Minister Mitsotakis at his dress to COM27 in uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, said that we need radicalism as well as real, realism. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good word in, in order to approach the current situation, the current geopolitical situation in all aspects. Our actions must, must shield our societies from populist forces both in, in the Holy West, in Europe, in, in the US. I remember as commissioner, I experienced Obama administration. And uh, during my mandate, I also experienced Trump administration. It was really very painful, frankly speaking. I saw in real terms what does mean arrogance in particular against Europe, against all of us as the leadership of Europe. So uh, we have to be very careful about what society can realize, can accept, can recognize in order to build this common ground between political community and societies. So I, I really believe that at the same time, we have to address more thoroughly, more in depth, some key issues, such as, first one, how are we going to engage the whole society in this very demanding effort? You know better than me. The majority of you, maybe you are economists. Demand drives supply, after all. <laughs> we have to avoid to be naive. <laughs> we have to avoid to ignore the hard reality. Otherwise, we will not be result-oriented and just to talk a lot. Second, how we can give sufficient real incentives to the business sector to invest in a greener future. Incentives which are additional and beyond the so-called corporate social responsibility actions. We need something more. We are going beyond as business as usual. And third one, how can policymakers promote research and development in new greener technologies? We need this tool, we need this instrument. 
Dear friends, while we remain focused on our strategic goal, we must demonstrate the necessary reflexes and be flexible and be adjustable. For example, discuss short-term measures like, like increasing liquid aid production as we did in Greece until we overcome the energy crisis. It was inevitable. We need to safeguard the present to build a sustainable future. And to achieve that, we need first society on our side. I think this is very, very crucial. And second, including governments and political leaders with a vision, real vision about the green future, who can build bridges and who can show leadership. Governments that adopt realistic policies to promote green investments in new technologies such, such, a, such as uh, hydrogen, engage the consumers, the society, as I said, overall, but adapt to the consequences of climate change. I think it's a, it's a realistic triangle. Because I have to, to keep the limited time, <laughs> Yanis, don't worry. Uh, I, I have to go to climate crisis and civil protection as Minister for Climate Crisis and Civil Protection. It is a really very demanding field. I remember when I, I accepted this position after a request by Prime Minister Mitsotakis, my dear colleague, former Ebola coordinator from US uh, Obama administration at that time, we were together responsible as Ebola coordinator in both Europe and US. Uh, he told me that, my dear friend, you are really addicted to minefields. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> maybe it's my destiny. <laughs> so, um, we have to see together the link between climate crisis and civil protection. No doubt it is the core feature of the newly established Hellenic Ministry for Climate Crisis and Civil Protection. As you know, it's a sort of an experiment, and this is why we already funded uh, by some European funds uh, from DG Reform, for example, uh, to support us to build in a correct way the structure of, the, of this ministry, because it will be maybe the new example for other uh, European countries. Um, Sweden already started going to this uh, way of thinking. So uh, we are completely obliged to achieve. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, this example uh, is going in completely bad way, and uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big weight. But we continue because we strongly believe that this link is of utmost importance. This ministry was created, above all, to meet the needs, the new needs due to climate change in disaster risk management. Our main goal in our everyday life, 24-7, is to bridge the traditional approach to disaster risk management with focuses on the response as Yannis already said, with three key pillars, prevention, preparedness, and resilience, all together. This is our new dogma, which really guides all our action and initiatives. It is a holistic approach aiming to enhance our adaptation efforts and strengthen our country's climate resilience, an approach which put, puts emphasis on collaboration and synergies, not only at the national level, 
but also at the regional level, at the European level, at the global level. Why we insist on this? Maybe you don't know, but uh, Greece, uh, it is the most prone country in Europe with all types of hazards, natural disasters, from volcano until floods, uh, forest fires, everything. <laughs> Only Italy and Greece, they can experience all these uh, types of natural disasters. And uh, at the same time, uh, Greece is very beautiful. And as Junger said, this is, uh, I think, is the, is the pity. But uh, uh, this uh, beautiness is a sort of, uh, what can I say, uh, it's a victim of its beautiness because of its landscape. Islands, small islands, high mountains, very close to the, to the uh, shores. So it's very easy to see the floods. <laughs> very close to all these things. It's a completely different landscape than Portugal, my dear friend. <laughs> but we have to deal with these old challenges. And in this direction, no doubt, we need European Civil Protection Mechanism and Rescue U. Last summer's wildfires in Europe showed once again the hard way that no country alone can respond effectively to wildfires and natural disasters in general. For example, in California, the richest region in the world, a lot of excellent universities, research something, but every year they cannot deal with the wildfires. Why? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a big question. But until now, we didn't find a real solution in order to deal with this problem due to climate change, due to our inability to find realistic and real solutions on the ground. For many reasons, we, we remain really a victim because of our inability to deal with this problem. I also remember, at that time, I was special envoy in, 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 in Brussels. The devastating floods were in Germany one of the most prominent European country, and also Belgium, with a lot of victims. So this phenomenon is not only in the third world. For example, in Pakistan, when we experienced recently this uh, very devastating case. We, we have to realize and to understand that Nobody alone can deal with this problem. We have to be together. We are in the same boat. So we need to find collective action. We need European umbrella. And when I was commissioner, regardless of the Brexit, I, I spent a lot of time, uh, I'm against Brexit. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I try a lot in order to convince the British authorities that uh, they have to stay very close to the European Civil Protection Mechanism because it is a collective, collective uh, structure, action. And at the end of the day, it is about money. <laughs> it, it is more, more cost efficient and effective than to be alone. <laughs> so uh, the only way to address the consequence of climate crisis is to work together. The answer is collective action. We need all stakeholders on board. And of course, the, this cannot be done overnight. 
This is, may sound trivial, a sort of cliche, but the global, the European, and our experience from last year in Greece made clear that. Increasing preventive measures and structure in the relation to response is a gradual process. It's not automatic. It cannot be done overnight. Just a comparison. Last year, we had more than uh, 6 million uh, burnt hectares in the whole Europe. In 2021, in Greece, we had more than 1.5 million. And this year, due to this dogma, we had just only 1,080,000 uh, hectares only. So 10 times, 15 times less. It's not a miracle, <laughs> no. We spent a lot of time, we changed many things, but we are at the starting point. We need a lot to be done, frankly speaking. So we are building our prevention capacities, but at the same time, we secure that our response capacities remain robust and effective. Because sometimes some activists, they insist on only prevention. But in order to reach specific results about prevention, you have to spend a lot of time, a lot of money through transition period. You cannot make this big reform and change overnight. So these criticisms is completely out of the reality. So let me at this point elaborate more on the specific pillars of prevention, preparedness, and response. Prevention, we need to increase our focus on preventive measures and activities, and of course, to financially support them. Forest clearing, for instance, shouldn't take place on an ad hoc basis. It must, it must be part of a strategic multi-annual program, including removal of accumulated fuel on the ground and forest management. Synergies need to be created with other ministries horizontally. Several sectors of the economy need to be engaged. For example, farmers who can help us in this effort to reduce Forest, forest fuel, and something completely strange in Greece. In Greece, unfortunately, we don't find enough insurance for the buildings, for the houses, for everything. For example, the average percentage in Europe is uh, more or less 78 percent. In Greece, just 14.9 only. So we have to focus on this, and we need your support, excellent economist here, because sometimes the society has to understand that the insurance is not only for the profit of the insurance company, but it's also a protection for the whole uh, country. Preparedness. Just a few words. For the first time last year, European fire, firefighters from France, Romania, Germany, Bulgaria, Finland, and Norway were based in Greece, pre-positioned, in, and participate in a pre-positioning pilot project. Our experience showed that the pre-positioning modules assisted substantially the local firefighting forces, bringing added value in terms of capacity and exchange of expertise. Why this? Because through the different way, years before, we have to wait from a support from Europe after two, three days. And everything was burned. <laughs> so the preposition project is very important because we have the support at the critical time when we need them. Response. We are working with our European partners to strengthen further, further the EU civil protection mechanism and the rescue EU mechanisms is part of the EU mechanisms. Under rescue EU, 
the European Union has established a reserve that can be deployed in the event of an emergency in any EU member state, for example, aerial means. We have to create really European fleet, which be under the instructions of a small, experienced people in Brussels and to send these planes to Portugal, to Greece, but we have an objective assessment where they are going. Not just if the Minister of Greece, Stylianidis, is ready to accept to send planes and Canadairs in Portugal. We send Canadairs in Portugal and in France for the first time. This reserve includes firefighting aircraft, medical equipment, and specialized search and rescue teams. This, all these are experienced due to the pandemic and due to our inability to deal with the pandemics, in particular, as you remember, in, in North Italy, without real instruments to, 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 to save lives. No ventilators, because we don't have enough steel in Europe. I, I remember this experience. I was in Brussels just after my mandate, and it was really very painful, very painful. Let me conclude these initial remarks. The times are challenging. The dilemmas are hard. The cost of inaction is higher than ever. But allow me to repeat, action must be grounded on realism characterized by pragmatic policies engaging with society. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to our discussion, Yanis. Uh, I try to, to answer <laughs> or to put on the table some ideas. Uh, you know that uh, uh, it's difficult to be very familiar with all these aspects in this very demanding field, but I try to be a good student, my dear friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christos, for that very comprehensive um, overview. Um, I'm going to start, I mean, it's, it's fascinating what you mentioned that, you know, you're thinking about this ministry as an example, as a prototype even, for what may happen in other countries. And uh, uh, given that you're building, you know, processes, governance, and structures in this ministry, you mentioned a lot of times this idea of collective action. So I want to ask you that in, in, in two particular ways. So let's start with the one, um, collective action when it comes to private and public collaborations, right? You mentioned the role of business, something that is quite uh, uh, relevant for this, uh, for this audience. Can you tell us a bit where you see both the opportunities as well as the, the, the challenges in your experience in terms of you know, governments and the public sector working with businesses in order to be effective when it comes to dealing with the climate crisis? And it's, um, as I already said and I emphasized on this, one bad example is what is happening now in Greece about this collaboration between private sector, insurance companies, and public sector. I know that in Portugal, they try a lot in order to find really local, national solution to increase the ensure attitude in Portugal and to give the chance this new attitude to be a sort of preventing measure against forest fires, floods, and so on. It's difficult to um, say that this is a solution for Greece, this is a solution for Portugal, this is a solution for Italy, for UK. Um, we have to adapt and to adjust depends on the real terms in each of our country. But um, I think in Greece uh, we need 
this approach to find a PPP, private public partnership, in order to convince the people, the society, that this is a real benefit for the people. Not only in order to make preventive measures against hazards, but also about their houses, their money, and their <laughs> future. Sometimes the people, they cannot understand that it's better to pay something less in order to, see, to give something definitely more in the future, in the medium term, and so on. At the same time, I strongly believe that uh, uh, we need businesses, we need private sector to be on board. Otherwise, we will fail. Why? We will fail because uh, um, I think, and especially after the cost of the pandemic, um, it's difficult for governments and public sector and public administration to be enough efficient and effective to cover all these new demands due to climate change. We need private sector, but what is the best way in order to engage the private sector? Some people, they, they said that we already gave this, uh, some incentives uh, for social responsibility, reduce the taxes and so on and so on. But is it enough? I, I believe that is not enough. We need innovative ways in order to give the chance to the private sector, not waiting in a medium and long term some benefits, 2015, 2055, but in short term. This is the real incentive. Mm -hmm. It's not easy right. to find such innovative solutions, but this is what we need from you as LBS. <laughs> you have the, the authority, you have the knowledge, you have the expertise to give to the governments uh, such uh, suggestions, such, uh, such uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wonderful. So, so it's, a, it's a big challenge to bring the two, two, two sectors together to work on these issues. Clearly, you know, there's always the carrot and the stick sort of approach, uh, their taxes or incentives and subsidies and so on. And in some cases, they worked, right? If you look at for example, the energy industry and how uh, subsidies by governments have really propelled things like solar and renewables. It worked quite, quite well. My, yeah. my, my team in, in Greece, which is really very familiar with this, he gave me a, a sort of proposal about capital deployment. Innovative financial vehicles such as green bonds or concessional loans, or even emission reduction purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. is something in which we can discuss in some councils in Europe, or also, why not, with, uh, with UK, to create a sort of European fund mm -hmm. to be very flexible and to be very approachable from some business, First of all, to make investments in this greener mm -hmm. dimension, more greener dimension, but also to find some ways for PPP. Mm -hmm. And maybe we will see how we can utilize some funds already established in Europe. For example, the Green Fund, mm -hmm. which is really very useful in Greece in some times in order to see some investments in renewable uh, energy. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you see in the last uh, uh, three, four years in Greece, we expand and we increase our investment in green energy more than 120% because of these European funds. Mm -hmm. so, we have to find solutions. And as always, right. we have to send the message to the society that no surprises, step by step, but at the same time, 
you have to pay because you are responsible. I think, as you said, stick and carrot with clear responsibilities, clear policies, and clear framework. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the way in order to convince the people that we mean business. I'm glad you you mentioned the European level funds and all the innovation in the financial industry. Yeah. As you know, it's an industry that is often accused for greenwashing or labeling a lot of these financial instruments. And then that's, of course, where the European Union is making quite a bit of a progress in terms of regulating these green funds, having the taxonomy out in order to say, you know, what is really green, what is not green. Um, but but in your experience, both as a minister, well, but also in my field. Yeah, <laughs> the minefield. <laughs> it's, it's, what is the green? So this is the fun part. So yes, uh, there we go. So so if you were to to draw your experience, both as a commissioner as well as a minister, in terms of you know, I said working with multiple countries, not only in the finance sector, but also what you mentioned earlier about the, the firefighters stationed in different countries. So what are the the the, the and, and you mentioned this? We need collective action. This climate crisis is not only one country's problem. It's it's all of us, right? So what are some of the in your experience, what are some of the, the, the challenges uh, and, and obstacles or even opportunities that you see in terms of countries working together in order to address the, the climate crisis? I, swear, I mean, we can talk global, but especially European level. Give me the chance to add something about the previous question. And I would like to, to mention two examples of a really very good public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. In two very small Greek islands in Halki and in Astipale. Mm -hmm. We saw there an excellent collaboration between business sector and public sector in Halki with uh, Citroën and uh, in, uh, in Astipale with uh, uh, Volkswagen, mm -hmm. where the whole island could be a sort of an experiment for electrical cars, and at the same time, to be completely autonomous about renewable energy. So it is a good example. And we will see specific results in the, in the next period, just three, four uh, months uh, after that. And uh, I, I think we can find such really innovative solutions in order to establish these incentives and to find solutions to engage at the same time, simultaneously, societies and business sector. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, show them that they can act together. And they have different responsibilities, but right. they are in the same boat at the end of the day. Right. So about this uh, <laughs> really uh, very difficult question about the synergies, collective actions, and collaboration. Maybe one of the reasons why Brexiteers persuaded people about Brexit, it was this really difficult job to create this unanimity <coughs> inside the European institution. You have to spend time. And sometimes the timing is so crucial. But in my experience as European Commissioner, because I started to, to convince uh, European countries about Rescue U. Give me the chance to say a few words. Rescue U, um, it is... Uh, one of the most important instrument for European civil protection mechanisms to create really common means to deal with all types of hazards. And it was unfortunately a result due to forest fires in Portugal in 2017. It was a vision for many people even before me, for example, um, my dear uh, predecessor, Kristalina Georgieva, also um, Jacques Delors. But always it was difficult to convince 
northern part of Europe to spend more money as contributors in order to, to give money to the north people, right. northern people, because they, they cannot care and they don't care about uh, forests and so on. It was completely, frankly speaking, out of the reality. It, 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 it is not correct. After Portuguese experience, and uh, I remember with uh, Jean-Claude Junior, we stated that uh, enough. Europe is not just to say condolences. Europe has to act now, yesterday, immediately. Otherwise, we will see every year a lot of victims because of this climate impact. Because it was October, if you remember. You can imagine October devastating forest fire for four days without any ability to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Mega fires, 600 Celsius degrees. Yeah. Nobody can deal with this issue. So we establish Rescue U and we needed more money. We needed also some contribution from north and south. And I remember my meeting with, uh, with Chancellor Merkel. Because Germany is always is a crucial factor in order to convince European institutions to accept new ideas. And uh, I was in Berlin in a special meeting with her. And uh, I really tried to persuade here that it's very important not only for Southern Europe, but also for Northern Europe. And it is a tool, not only for forest fires, but it is a tool for a European collective action for all hazards, floods and everything. She really accepted the idea because at that time she wanted to send a, a signal to South Europe that Germany is not cynical to North, to Southern problems. And she told me, I'm in favor, but you have to start from now in order to convince all German landers. <laughs> Germany is a federal state. <laughs> and I, I remember I, I was visited all landers, regional governments, parliaments, <laughs> in order to convince about this. And I found really a lot of reluctance. But when they saw forest fires in Sweden, everyone realizes that, ah, this is a common problem. Is not only southern problem, and we found some problems from uh, from Dutch, from uh, Netherlands, uh, but we 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 achieve we really achieve a, a, a very vast majority in the, the European Parliament, um, more than eighty five percent, only. Um, far right people from UK and some from Germany and um, I don't I, I I cannot remember now the leader of of Brexiteers. Uh, yes, yes, Farage. <laughs> he was against. <laughs> Completely against. And and he told me, my dear friend, you are not coming from south in order to uh, bring people from north to south. <laughs> this is it was his argument but okay. <coughs> That's another but, panel altogether, yes. <laughs> Which we should have at some point. Yes. Now, and especially after devastating floods in Germany and Belgium, and also um, forest fires in France and Germany, in Czech Republic, right. <laughs> all of them, they realized that we are really in the same boat about hazards. And when they saw and they experienced that they need firefighters for Greece. They need firefighters for Portugal because they have more experience than them. They know 
the ground, they know the issue, <laughs> they realize that, oh, we need each other. So this is a collective action. At the same time, they realize that if we have these planes or helicopters or other tools for the whole Europe, we need just 30, 35 helicopters for the whole Europe. And we have to decide where they are going on a critical time. If we decide to have enough at the national level, we need each member state more than 20 for Greece, 15 for Portugal, um, 50 for uh, France. So if you add na at the national basis, you need more than 100. If you need at the, as a European fleet, you need just only 35. So it's economy of scale. <laughs> so what we need is to find the good ways. We need objective procedures and processes in order to take the decisions. Mm -hmm. This is very critical. Uh, but we need scientists to decide about where they are going. And now everyone is on board. And now in the last uh, September, when even France and Germany for the first time asked for, for help or support, and uh, Greece supported France, the best European country in, in uh, fighting for a forest fire. Yeah. So we need each other, and it is economy of scale. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so easy, but what we need, really objective processes in order to give the chance to the people to realize that it's not only for the south or for the north, it's for all of us together, and it is a common tool. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll expand that uh, kind of a question a little bit before I turn to the audience for some uh, uh, Q&A from them. But um, Christo, I know that during the Ebola crisis, there, were n there was no country left that you didn't visit. And you were actually one of the few that actually, in the middle of the Ebola outbreak, you, you very bravely uh, uh, you know, traveled to these countries, right? Uh, to many countries. I'm not sure if there's any country in the world left that you haven't been. Uh, but, um, so, uh, in, in, in other words, you have also seen the devastation that happens in, in, especially in parts of Africa, not only because of these pandemics, but they are the countries that have contributed the least to climate change, and a lot of the times they suffer some of the worst consequences. So if you were to take a step back and think about the role of, the, of Europe, of perhaps of the West, in terms of how do we help these countries build resilience, build, build climate capacity to deal with this crisis. Have we learned anything from all these pre, pre, uh, previous humanitarian crises? And, and uh, can we be effective in helping these countries that are suffering the most? Well, truth of the matter is because of us and our emissions and the problem that we created, right? What, can, what, can, what are your views in that respect in terms of global policy uh, towards the global south? You disagree with my good friend from Washington. That, uh, he believes that uh, uh, I'm really addicted to the minefields instead of I'm a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a fine line. <laughs> it's okay. a brave man in a you know, okay. minefield. But <laughs> it, is, it is addiction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's addiction anyway. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> it's my destiny. OK. Um, look, my experience as Ebola coordinator, it was really painful. Uh, and uh, at that time, um, from November 2014 until uh, September 2015, we were, together with uh, US uh, colleagues, uh, in a very frustrating, in a very difficult position that uh, if we, we could not keep the virus in the only three affected countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. And if we lost the game and we saw virus be entered in Nigeria with 200 million people, in this case, I'm sure we, we would realize pandemic before COVID-19. Fortunately, for 
many reasons for uh, a real decisiveness for some of the leaders in the three affected countries. We, we had achieved this goal, and, and, and I once again realized that we need this collective decisiveness at least as the western part of the of the planet but due to a lot of visits in africa in latin america in asia for humanitarian reasons uh, and educational emergencies mentioned and so so and and etc uh, etc et i i saw that climate change day by day is becoming a, a real reason for a, a new migrants, for a new movements from developed countries to develop world. I, I remember a visit in Ethiopia, northern part of this country, and uh, it's, it's my first time to see so thin lengths of, of birds, of animals, because of, of the droughts. No water, completely no water. And many people to move to north. Many people, thousands of people. We have to see how we can deal with the Africa. I strongly believe that we need a new partnership with Africa. We need to see a new, a new a nexus between development aid and humanitarian aid. Because humanitarian aid is just for the emergency situation. Development aid is, is a real tool in order to build something for the future. But uh, um, sometimes, if you don't be in, in real terms engaged in humanitarian field, you can lose everything. So this nexus, development aid and humanitarian aid, could be the only tool to see real investments in this country in order to convince the people to stay there. And we need a, a real partnership with, between European Union and Africa, but genuine partnership. Really, with common incentives, with uh, some, uh, I think, co critical gestures from our side to them. For example, they need to invest a lot in agriculture sector. Mm -hmm. In this case, maybe we have to uh, see together about the common agriculture policy. It's the elephant in the room in the European institutions. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue. It's difficult now with uh, this short uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> time to engage in this thing. But uh, I think you have to start this discussion about Africa as a new partnership between Europe between West and Africa. We cannot continue about Africa as business as usual. It's not a solution. We will see the impact of climate, refugees, and migrants, not in the next decades, I think, in the next five years, in the next seven, eight years. And it will be something beyond imagination. You're, you're, I was, was actually reading uh, recently a World Bank report that was trying to estimate how many millions of people were internally displaced in Africa because of broadly defined climate reasons. And the numbers, as you say, were 80, 85 million people estimated. 250 million people, they will be forced. Yeah. They will force in the next uh, three, four years. Not only because of the conflict, because of war, as a climate, migrants, and refugees. Yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. So as you can see, uh, we, with Rishos, I had another 35 questions. But uh, I'm not going <laughs> to keep you here all evening. I would like to, do, to, to turn it to the audience for 
um, a, a couple of questions. Please raise your hands. I believe we have a couple of microphones uh, going around. Let's start with uh, uh, here. Got it Go ahead. There we go. It's a privilege to be among young people. Always. <laughs> Sometimes I, my son said, why these people? So close to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the young ideas. There we go. Sorry, uh, go thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yanu, for the, the panel and organizing everything. And um, thank you so much, Minister, uh, for, for the talk. Uh, my name is Godfrey. I'm uh, the founder of a tree planting organization called Tree App. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to react on two things that you had mentioned. The first one is about housing insurance in Greece. My father and housing my insurance. Yes, insurance, yeah. My father and my brother actually both recently bought a house, not in the middle of nowhere, in the north of Athens. Uh -huh. Both of them contacted maybe 10 private insurers, and no insurer accepted to insure the house. From anyone they were speaking to, they were saying there's too many risks because of wildfires. Yes. So I'm just saying that it's, I'm not surprised about the 14% that we have in Greece versus in other countries. 14.9. 14.9. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because we just cannot get the houses insured. Um, just wanted to mention that, you know, I, I completely understand where this number is coming from. The second thing I, w I wanted to mention is, um, so my organization, Tree App, we plant trees actually all around the world, and we plant a bit in Sunio, um, uh -huh. as well actually in the south of, uh, of Athens. And uh, I personally lived firsthand the wildfires that happened in Athens, in Attica, I mean, you know, in Mati in, in 2018. Like, you know, just in front of our home, seeing these wildfires, you know, this happening in front of your home is really life-changing versus watching this on television. I'm sure that people in the UK who have seen the wildfires happening last year start realizing the impact it's having in front of their home. And as, a, as an entrepreneur, I'm curious to think, what are the technological advancements that you believe should be done to fight these wildfires? Is it, for example, new kind of drones that would help, I don't know, for example, spray water on these forests? Is it more forest management that will help protect these forests when these wildfires are happening? Where do you believe there should be investment in new technologies to help limit the spread of wildfires or limit even the start of wildfires, considering that in any case in Greece, year over year is just going to be more over time? Thank you so much. Thank you, because uh, you give me the chance to explain some things about uh, our approach in order to upgrade our civil protection mechanism in Greece. In particular, through new technological tools. Um, first of all, the climate change impact is something completely new. And we need new instrument in order to deal with this impact. And uh, here, we need to rely on a specific scientific data in order to deal with this. Not only for prevention, but also for preparedness. And this is why we decided to allocate a lot of money to create a national database for natural disasters. And what is the role of this national Database with a small teams of scientists, meteorologists, meteorologists chemists, um, foresters, all these uh, uh, scientists we can deal with uh, hazards. They can create modeling, not only at the national level, but also at the regional and local level for creating preventive measures and at the same time to give the chance to the operational people, firefighters for example, to have some scenarios in order to decide at the critical time about the planes, about the helicopters, and where they can move their forces. So we need to connect, to relate scientific analysis, scientific data with the operational decision making. It's so crucial and critical, also for prevention, but also for response. 
Second point about early warning systems. We need in all, in, uh, in all forests to have early warning systems. And we can see the starting point of the problem at the beginning. Because as you know, you can deal with the forest fires in uh, two minutes with uh, just a, a glass, in five minutes with something more, and after five minutes, you can go to the benefit of the God. <laughs> because they can become mega fires. So scientific approach, scientific analysis, connected with operational decision making, early warning systems, and also synergies and collaboration with all stakeholders, volunteers, local authorities, and all parts of the state, police, army, and of course, the major stakeholders, the firefighters. I think this triangle, early warning system, technological tools, uh, science and connection with operational uh, decision making, and also these synergies among stakeholders are the three pillars in order to prevent. In order to, to be there before the situation is becoming out of control. This is the most important. About insurance in Greece, Prime Minister Misodakis knows well the problem. Um, because he's coming from the private sector, he knows well the problem. Um, sometimes to convince the people, and because of some stereotypes from the past, the people, they believe that the, uh, the companies is, about, is only about profit. <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, I think there is a small team which is responsible to give a proposal in the next uh, three months, especially about the benefits of this, uh, uh, of the insurance attitude, and maybe can be connected with uh, some taxes, property taxes. It's a, it's, a, it's a new idea, and it will be more acceptable by the society. But we have to wait to see after the elections. <laughs> Great, thank you. So in a very traditional Greek way, we're about uh, minus 20 minutes <laughs> to the end, uh, but uh, be that as it may, very uh, important conversation. So I would like to take one more question. Very brief, and my name is Silvia Pavone. I'm a journalist with um, Sustainable Views, which is a new title, part of the Financial Times Group. I, w I wanted to follow up on the question about insurance, because you seem to suggest that property in Greece tends not to be insured because people, owners, do not go and buy insurance. But I, I do know that uh, insura climate poses a big risk for insurers as well. And we do know that there are certain risks, certain properties, certain areas, certain geographies even, that insurance companies anticipate will not be insurable in the future. So do you have an idea of, of the responsibility in terms of um, whether it's because of uh, individuals or companies do not want to seek out and protect. One million Yeah, you're, you're kind of <laughs> laughing, so I'm, um, yeah, okay, so over to you then. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's really very difficult question, and I think maybe we need a, a common European policy in this insurance approach for properties. Why? Because uh, I think that we can balance this risk in many different hazards. For example, in Greece, in Italy, we have uh, unfortunate earthquakes. You can imagine that it's difficult for any insurance companies to 
take this risk for earthquake without real legislation about the buildings. <laughs> we, we already experienced what was happening in Turkey. Beyond imagination. I was there first night, and I experienced many painful things in my life, but what I saw in Turkey is really so painful. Because of the lack of the anti-seismic code in their legislation. And the implementation of any anti-seismic code. In Greece, fortunately, we have one of the best anti-seismic code in the world, close to the Japanese oh, wow. legislation. So, and we have a very good seismologist, people who knows very well about the earthquake sequences and so on. But uh, it's difficult for the insurance companies to take the risk just only in one country. I, I had uh, some discussions with uh, some people from very well-known uh, insurance companies. I don't want to say now their names. Uh, and uh, many of them, they strongly believe that we have to see this new risk due to climate change in a completely different way of thinking than we had until now. So we need to see more broader about the risks. I'm not ready now to give an answer specific to this question, but I think it's a crucial question also for you, for LBS, <laughs> because it is really also economical issue. <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah. financial issue in all aspects what we believe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but <laughs> I cannot <laughs> say more. Great. Thank you. So uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we will have to close this event. Let me first uh, thank the Wheeler Institute for hosting us, uh, generously hosting us uh, today. And then Tiago specifically and his team did a wonderful job in, in, in organizing this uh, event, so the entire LBS team. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us in person, and thank you to all of you who joined us uh, um, uh, online. I hope I covered a number of your questions as I was reading them. Um, and, uh, uh, of course... Uh, Disappointed. Uh, sorry? Many of them. No, no, no. We, we actually <laughs> covered a lot of them as we were speaking, oh, okay. so it's, uh, okay. it's great. Um, a couple of things I need to leave you with. So, first of all, the, there will be a recording of our entire conversation today with uh, Minister Stylianidis that is going to be posted at the, uh, on the Wheeler Institute YouTube uh, channel. And uh, to invite you to the next event on uh, May 23rd, when the Wheeler Institute is hosting Professor Daron Asimoglu from M uh, MIT to, for the, to talk to us about his new book. And of course, Minister, thank you so much for, for uh, spending with us some of your very, very valuable uh, time to share your views on these very, very important issues. We thank you for joining us. and. Uh, indeed, wish you best of luck with a very, very difficult, complex, multifaceted, and complex. continuously evolving problems, crises, and minefields uh, that you are dealing on a, on a daily basis. It was really an honor and a privilege to have you, and, and, and thank you for all your insights and, and the wisdom that you shared with us today. Thank you. Please join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you.